Hi, I'm Mark, producer of Roundtable, a TV series born here in New York City at the legendary Manhattan Neighborhood Network Studios. The exchange of ideas is important, and that is why we bring to you the following presentation. Please watch. Good evening, and welcome to Single Shot Show at Manhattan Neighborhood Networks Roundtable. Tonight, we will be going into some specifics of uh, experimental photography, namely in uh, tricks, techniques, and uh, different approaches which helps you to create something unusual, a little bit uh, in a broader spectrum than just taking a picture and printing it. And uh, in order to discuss it, we invited one of the inventors of photographic techniques and a uh, person who perfected his own pretty unique process, Michael Calavita. Hello, Michael, again. Always a pleasure to see you on the program. Thank you for having me. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how we creating those unusual photographs. Uh, I mean, now we're in a very interesting spot in our development. A lot of people are uh, using uh, just software means to create them, and uh, sometimes uh, they're very effective. Some of the photographers who started creating uh, experimental and surrealistic images with film actually eventually switched to digital and hard at the sand. Some because it's uh, easier to do it, some uh, because it gives you some abilities that uh, analog processes don't allow, but I do firmly believe that uh, film-based photography have some features that at least yet are not replicated uh, by digital processes and even if they are then uh, not completely and not in the same way so let's talk about it let's compare basically our toolboxes <coughs> sure um for the type of photography that i do as we've discussed before everything i do is on the one original 8x10 <coughs> film chrome there are no interferences whatsoever mm -hmm. from you know, anything that would in any way conflict with the natural, organic picture-taking process. Mm -hmm. What I do is a true tribute to the art of traditional photography. So, as we discussed before, through my 21 fundamental principles of pure photography, the long list that we read here on the show, yeah. you know, starts with, for instance, I will not paint on a human figure. I will not paint on the film itself. If I am to use one of my paintings and incorporate it with a portrait or with any composition, it has to happen through the picture-taking process. I have to take a traditional picture of my art and then on that same piece of film later marry it to the subject. So in many senses the correlation or the comparison when we talk about digital and analog mm -hmm. can be very similar. You know, for instance, with double exposure or triple yes. exposure, I'm going to show you a shot here on the show and get your reaction to it, a piece I just completed mm -hmm. of my son again. And I found this light in Brazil and it had four different quartz lit color bulbs uh -huh. that I incorporated into this shot through about 150 different exposures. Now for beginners, when we go to post capture, we can pretty much take any group of images and put them together mm -hmm. on the same piece of film. Much like masters of photography did from the very beginning, mm -hmm. when they went into the dark room and through optical assemblage, they take 5, 10, 15 different negatives and they project those images onto one piece of paper. So for me, with my process, everything is done in that one original piece of film. And if we compare that again to digital, yes, we can take 
digital illustration programs and we can do what the masters did in the darkroom and put many of them together. But in camera, I mean, I have a new Nikon digital camera, one of the latest, yes. and it actually has a feature that incorporates multiple exposure. However, the maximum amount of exposures you can do in camera with this camera is 10. And even still, you have 30 seconds between exposures to marry them all together. You can choose one to 10, but if after 30 seconds you haven't done your second shot, well then you're back to whatever is on that file. So I mean, there are vast differences. I imagine the technologies will improve as time goes on. And we'll probably have cameras that can do many numbers of them. I know you're an expert in this digital field. And when I first told you about this, you expressed to me that you can actually do it digitally. Yeah, and we actually will talk about it later. Well, uh, there is something else uh, which differentiates even uh, those incorporated uh, mechanisms for taking multiple exposures on digital camera from the analog process. And I do believe it's instrumental difference. Basically, how it's done in digital, you have a sensor and you take an exposure. So basically, it takes a percentage of this information, basically just makes the layer to be to certain percentage transparent and merges it with the uh, other layers. You take in the whole thing. While uh, on uh, analog exposure, it's ongoing process. Everything that's being recorded is being recorded uh, at its specific time in its specific context. You can have actually some of the images to be exposed much longer and they will still have about the same percentage as the ones that uh, was exposed at larger light but at a shorter period of time. They, uh, they will have about the same prominence if you, uh, uh, if you equate them properly. But with digital, in either cases, you will just have a percentage and you will just mechanically glue them together. Interesting. Yeah, so it's uh, a little different. However, as I said, uh, the uh, analog process can be replicated on digital camera. Uh, the way I'm doing it actually is right here. I basically took one of the very old and very beautiful Graflex lenses which actually does have this analog shutter right on the lens. So I Just like view camera lenses. Are precisely, you? Sure. yes. So I'm taking one continuous shot on bulb and just making several exposures sure. at the uh, necessary length. Well, making a contraption like this might be a little bit more complicated than necessary, and uh, it does require a few additional things that happening with it, but in terms of what I was just mentioning, that, in a way, is the closest thing you can do to uh, the analog uh, uh, multiple exposures because it actually is one continuous take of light, which is interrupted by the actual physical shutter. Sure. Yeah. But as you said, or alluded to a moment ago, the opacity and the density mm -hmm. is very, very different. Absolutely. So the feel is going to be completely different, as in you know, the case of my exposing I mean, 150 different exposures went into this piece that I'm going to surprise you with in a bit. And when you're doing 150 different exposures, I know in the Nikon it has an automatic balance, which I always shut off. I mean, I don't really mm -hmm. shoot digitally. Yeah. You've seen the few shots I've taken on the show here. Yes. But I had to shut that off to try to come close to the feel of what I get when I'm shooting film and doing it Absolutely, manually. Absolutely, yes. As I understand, uh, during these multiple exposures, you can't change those manual settings. Yes, while exactly. Doing it. So you basically have to proceed with the same settings. While in analog situation, you to a degree can modify them. You can do yeah. anything you need to do. Uh, one of the things that comes into mind, you can just put something with a small uh, opening in it in front of the lens, and uh, that would be your change of aperture. Or you can actually, on the lens, itself. Uh, on the analog lens, it can actually change the physical aperture during the shot. Close Which is the interesting. Shutter, yeah. Change uh, the aperture and then uh, get back to shooting. Which is great because compositionally you want the maximum amount of control. Exactly. So if you're shooting things that are layered, where you have a very far background, medium background, exactly. middle ground, foreground, you can set the f-stop 
to pull into focus all or to concentrate on one, and in each separate individual exposure, you can focus and draw the eye into these different elements to create an illusion that is really what makes the composition so wonderful. Well, uh, judging by what I've seen on your pictures, probably you was also manually refocusing during the shot at, uh, at so on the certain shots, because I wouldn't uh, sure. see how you would do it otherwise, right? Exactly. So on some shots, uh, you had to first focus camera on something close by and then bring it to the infinity. Probably that would be the only direction, because refocusing to anything besides infinity in this setting probably would be a little tricky. Sure, unless I want to open up the lens completely because I want to completely blur out the foreground and the background yeah. and just concentrate on the subject like is usually done with portraiture. Exactly. Where you don't want competing background elements disturbing your main attention to the portrait itself. You don't want to draw the attention away from the composition. Naturally, yes. Now, and uh, getting back to what I was saying about uh, digital multiple exposures, yes, contraption like this would be the closest thing you can do, but there is a simpler way actually. Okay. I guess we'll have to discuss it after the break, so we'll briefly touch it and uh, then continue talking about other fascinating techniques. Hello, this is Alex IG uh, from Single Shot with the next uh, single trick. Today we're going to be talking about uneven lighting. More often uh, you have to deal with just one strong source of light. The strongest one of course would be the sun. And uh, when it happens, uh, half of your object is uh, lit in very brightly and another half is very dark, just like my face right now. Is there anything you can do about it? Sure. You can uh, have professional lighting equipment, you can have professional light bouncing uh, screens and many other things. But uh, the simplest and easiest uh, thing you can use, especially if uh, you're doing it in a uh, casual environment, is a regular piece of paper. Put it right against uh, the direction of light and you will get the uh, source of light uh, uh, balanced and your light uh, being just right. Alright, we're back and uh, I promise to tell how you can actually make the analog picture without having any special equipment and uh, it's actually very simple. Just putting camera on continuous shot and uh, using something like this to cover it when you need to. Sure. That, uh, sure that will require a pretty steady tripod in order to do it and uh, specifically something that is cylindrical in shape not just a flat surface because this way you would be able to close it and then leave it so you would be able to change the setup or move the camera during the process. Sure. It will have the same problem as uh, the analog process has while the camera is uh, shooting you can't actually see the imagery you're photographing. Exactly. As I understand in your case it's uh, the same story, right? You can't actually see the scenery while uh, the exposure has begun, right? Exactly, because I put the holder in the back of the view camera. Mm -hmm. I set everything up, I can see through the lens on the ground glass what I'm composing, but once it's actually happening, you can't see it. No, the only ones that actually allow to do it are range finders, but they have <coughs> a lot of other trickery associated with them. And it's also true because when you choose different f-stops, you can't see the depth of field in focus. Uh -huh. You know, when you focus, you're, you know, usually in the ground glass, you want it bright so you can see what you're doing and the lens is wide open. Exactly. So the second you stop all the way down to 11, 16, 22 or more, you're pulling everything into focus. That's so you have to know kind of how much distance you have to focus on, you know, what you want to get in the shot. 
and uh, as I understand you actually quite often um, using uh, pretty shallow de depth of field which was al always fascinating for me because controlling something like this without actually seeing is pretty fascinating skill. And it's also hard when you're shooting portraits particularly because if someone moves in or out a little yes. you're now out of the field of focus. Absolutely. And often I might want the eyes super sharp and a portion of the hair blurred or you, know, you want to really concentrate on different portions or different places. And you know, again, it's really, really hard. If you stop down far, a little movement's not going to affect anything because you're going to have the depth of field to pull that back into focus. Yeah. I keep on looking at this uh, uh, interesting contraption we have on our table, so let's talk a little bit about it. Okay, this, a as I've said before, multiple exposure is just one part of my 21 fundamental principles. It really covers a lot. Indeed. From no filters to no optical assemblage to, as we said, no painting on the bodies to, I mean, many things that other people would consider a part of traditional photography, okay. I still stay away from. I mean, for instance, if someone wanted to take a picture of a picture, that's still part of the photographic process. Naturally. I particularly don't do that. I'll only take a picture of my art, my sculpture, my painting, my modern art, light wands. I mean, I go far beyond just the multiple exposures. This here, I haven't actually used yet, but I brought it here today because painting with light in photography is a broad term. You can Naturally, do painting yes. with light many ways. I can set up an architectural interior, for instance, where I could shut all the lights off in a room that's black. And I can open up the camera lens, and during my exposure, I can, with a light source, virtually move light, flash, project light on the walls and on every part of the interior, yes. and build it up at different degrees. So in the end, all you see in the photograph is a lit room. You don't know how I lit it. That's one way you can paint with light. You can also do a time exposure. Open your lens at night for car lights and things like that, which I just did a sequence of yes. recently that mm -hmm. I showed you. And with this tool, this is a color head. It goes on top of an enlarger. So when people want to make prints, you put your negative here, the light is transmitted through this, and the image is recorded down low on the paper. You can move this up or down with the right lens projecting mm -hmm. the light to get the different size you want on your paper. But ultimately, As if I you're know. making a color print, if you're doing black and white, you can just switch this knob so that you have no color and it's just the white light. And through paper that you use that has different amounts of contrast, you can dial in what you want. Or you can use contrast filters and have like a multi-grade paper to dial your contrast in that way. But when you want to go to a color print, it's like anything. If you go to a color printer now and you do your first print and you don't like the color, you adjust the color to dial in closer to what you want. Same with a color head. If I film, if I'm making a, a, a piece of film, a chrome or a, a, a paper print and I have too much magenta, for instance, I can turn back the magenta knob. I can use cyan, yellow, and magenta to control color in the dark room. I technically am not an experimental photographer, although I do experiment all the time. Because my process is sound. It's been something I've been using for 30 years. But this here is really a part of that experimental term. Because what I do here is on the bottom here is the light source. Mm -hmm. So if we were to plug this into the wall, this would light up. And as I dial these colors, you'd see yellow, oh, So cyan, you can uh, basically uh, get a precise shade of any color combining those three notes. Precisely. That's actually fascinating. And uh, as a side note, I wanted to say that when I'm referring to experimental photography, I'm not talking about it being a set process or a process that being in development. I'm talking about the process that is proprietary or rarely used and produce the results that you can't see with uh, 
in well, other understand. artists. It's, I understand uh, that, for sure. I'm referring more to the results than actually to the process. Gotcha. As uh, a lot of people uh, using, in general, uh, multiple exposure or long exposure for various reasons, but the results is what we're talking about here. Absolutely, and it's, I'm glad you said that because technique, even through my 21 fundamental principles, mm -hmm. who cares unless the composition is special? Everything is about the, I mean, the process is all important as I always speak about, but Absolutely. unless you're pulling in that audience and that viewer and moving them with something compositionally that you accomplished, people often don't care. You know, for instance, if a painter is using different paint, it's like, well, what did you paint? This is something I'm going to use soon, where if I pan this during exposure, I'm creating a solid color line streaking. Much like if I opened up the lens and a car went by and I had a streaking color light. Oh, well, that's uh, but with this, a true color painting. Exactly. So as we were saying, there are different forms of painting with light and color painting in this case. I'm going to actually experiment with this now where I turn these dials where I start with yellow and as I'm streaking, I go to magenta and then blue so that in the same streak, the gradient, I can dial perfect. in the different yes, colors. And it's going to be another useful tool. Well, uh, I'm and you'll dying see what to I see do. how uh, it will turn out. It sounds like uh, some pretty interesting and unusual tool. Sure. Yeah. And uh, again, as a side note, I actually can uh, agree with the uh, general public on that. It really is important what you see as the end result of the process. And the uh, artist who is just worrying about how it's done is more of a hobbyist than an artist. The artist who yeah. actually is proud of the final result is a true artist. That's just my opinion. Yes. In my case, I again believe the process. I mean, it's, a, it's a, not an argument, but it's a juxtaposition, if you will, because uh -huh when people see my work and then they understand it's natural then they do a double take and they say well, well how is that possible so the process again is important but that's only after someone's moved by the image to begin with absolutely the interest to the process is uh, induced by such an unusual result that people just don't understand how yeah. it's done that is the true uh, tool for a great artist the process that actually make it to be so interesting. Sure. Oh, we'll be back after... Today I will be talking about depth of field, so if you're familiar with the concept, you can move on uh, to the next episode. But uh, if you're not, I'm often asked uh, how the aperture works besides just controlling how much light gets into a camera and how light or dark your image is. And in simple words, the larger your opening of the aperture is, the smaller will be distance on which uh, your camera is focused. And if you would photograph something like this branch with the open aperture, you will get uh, the image that is focused only on a certain distance, something like this. But if you close it all the way down and take the same picture, you will get the uh, almost the whole plane, everything like this, to be uh, in focus. And in one case, you will get uh, more uh, focused attention of the viewer on a specific part of your photograph. Alright, we have a couple of minutes to fulfill the promise we made to our viewers. You was mentioning that there are a couple of uh, very recent works that uh, you wanted to actually show right on the show. Absolutely. So I started, I put my son to sleep at like 8 o'clock at night, started shooting immediately, and I work fast when I know I have to do so many exposures. I'm very careful yes. and I'm pro at it because I've been doing it for so long. But at 4.30 in the morning, I finished. So it was about eight hours of nonstop shooting. It was about 150 exposures. That's You've seen one, on but this is the one I'm really proud of. This is the one here. If we hold it up to the light. This actually is, wow. It's actually even 
more fascinating than the other one, but there is something else uh, we actually didn't mention. Uh, you probably noticed uh, all these mysterious sounds that was happening in our studio. And we actually have another guest, Romeo. Would you join come us. and join us? We actually right now have something that never happened in the studio before. We have the image, the actual negative, and the model from this negative. Exactly. So, Romeo, did you see it yourself? What do you think of it? Good. <laughs> Good? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, indeed one of uh, the most fascinating models that's been in front of your camera, and uh, this is indeed a very interesting depiction. And again, he had to sit still for that first portrait part and give me a natural smile, and it's really hard to do Absolutely. before I got to the adding of all of this, you know, oscillatory motion and, and, uh, and movement. And we have another one here as well, right? Yes. The one you was mentioning with uh, all those lights. They, here they well, it's much a, it's more a it's a, it's a similar light source because the yes. small lights that you see here are the same as these bigger lights. When I was in Brazil, I picked up quartz bulbs and made a modern art sculpture with four lights on top of each other. I actually mounted on top of a traffic light. And I used that light source for these pieces. This piece came about in an unusual way. I picked up recently Fuji Astia outdated film. Uh -huh. As you know, film is ridiculously expensive now. Absolutely, yes. 20 pieces of film cost $600 now. So I was fortunate in this case. I mean, I have about a thousand sheets on ice so I can continue shooting forever. But I found Estia film, which is wonderful. And it made me want to shoot Romeo for the flesh tones to see how the film responded. Mm -hmm. And then it led to me doing this piece so I could see the colors as well. Wow, fascinating. So, so mysteriously, Absolutely. the art. Well, just to round all this up, I just want to mention that it's a very unique situation. In photography, you usually don't see originals. And the closest thing to the original is a negative. Yes. So right now in the studio we have something that very rarely seen together. An original, an artist and the model. Oh, wow. Thank so you. guys, I'm just wishing you luck and creating this beautiful, fascinating works. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much, Romeo. It was a pleasure seeing you again. I'll see you next time. I hope you found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark for Roundtable. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Bye.